Luke chapter 2, verse 9 through 14. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Hi, my name is Cynthia and I'm a child of God and I'm here to share with you the gospel, which is the good news. The good news is that Jesus left his throne in heaven. He was born on earth in a, a very humble birth in a manger. He grew up and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He was crucified on the cross for our sins. The lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. And he was buried and he rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven and he's coming back for us very soon in a pre-tribulation rapture. At the end of the seven year tribulation, we'll be coming back with him and he'll set up his thousand year millennial reign here on earth. At the end of that thousand millennial reign, God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And we'll go into um, eternity with him. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. God is holy, without sin, and righteous, and just. Psalms 99, 9 tells us, For the Lord our God is holy. We are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 we all deserve death and separation from God due to our sins. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. But the good news tells us that God loves us even though we are sinners. God has given his only begotten son in order to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ died in our place and rose from death. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 says, For I delivered delivered." To you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Heaven is a free gift for sinners. We receive this gift only by faith and only through Christ. It is not a reward for those who do good things or good works. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God promises us that whoever believes only in his Son, Jesus Christ, for salvation can know with absolute certainty that they have eternal life. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 God promises us that we can never lose salvation. God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, are who keep us saved. And I gave them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So would you accept the fact that you deserve to go to hell, since that is God's judgment. But at the same time, 
God loves us in such a way that he has given his son to die on the cross in our place. Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins, so by simply believing in him, instead of our good works, we can be saved. If you trust in Jesus Christ alone to obtain the gift of salvation, God guarantees that you are eternally secure in him, and you will be with him forever in heaven. I want to talk about the joy of Christmas. I mean, I still remember as a little child going out with mittens on my hands, putting my hands in the snow and taking a bunch of snow in my hands, squashing it together to make a snowball, rolling it in the snow until that ball got bigger and bigger and finally really big. And then I would put it aside and start all over again. I would take a bunch of snow, squash it up into a little ball and roll it and roll it until I got another big snowball. I would make three of these. The first one was the largest and the third one was the smallest. Then I would stack them and put the smallest one on top and I would start looking for two rocks and a stick. I would take the stick and put it right where the nose should be and two black rocks would be placed right where the eyes should be and I called that creation my snowman. Then I had to find something for the mouth and I had fun making um I had fun making snowmen as a child. Uh, that was just absolutely a thrill. A second memory that I have as a child was Christmas Eve. And um, my mother would put together what we referred to as a smorgasbord of holiday food. On Christmas Eve, after the, Chris the candlelight service at church, we would get together and eat from the spread of food. And it was really great food. Um... I have so, so many fond memories of those days. It was something I looked forward to. Um, on Christmas Day, Christmas morning, I would wake up sometimes before my parents and um, try to stay in bed until they got up. Um, I just couldn't wait for them to get up so that I could go and start opening presents and um, to see all the toys and to see what all I got. <sighs> We'd go to my grandmother's house where all of the aunts and uncles and all of my cousins would gather together. And often we did a family gift exchange. Um, Christmas was a great time of the year. It was a time of anticipation. I looked forward to Christmas. I looked forward to opening the gifts and my heart would leap with joy with the things I'd been given. I still remember one year when I got my first Bible lambskin Bible that clasped shut and it had all the tabs on it telling me what each book was. I loved that Bible. I received my uh, Cabbage Patch doll. Portia Paulette, her name was. I received many things that I very much enjoyed. Um, I didn't get lots and lots of gifts because we weren't a, we, we were a poor family. But the things I did get, I very greatly appreciated. Um, Christmas was a time of anticipation. And is that what Christmas feels like to you? Do you look forward to Christmas? Um, is Christmas a time of anticipation? I don't know if that's true of you, but I know that it was true of many at the time that Jesus arrived. We are told that the Jews were waiting for their Messiah. There was great anticipation that he, that he would soon come. We know that when John the Baptist arrived, he was asked, are you the Christ? That is, are you the Messiah? And he answered, no, I am not. Although we are only told of two times in the Gospel of John, um, I suspect that John was asked those questions many more times. When Jesus arrived, he went through the same questioning. People were wondering whether or not he was the Messiah. In John 1, we are told that two men became Christ's disciples, John and Andrew. They found Jesus one afternoon and spent time with him. Their conclusion at the end of the day was that the man they spent the afternoon with was the Christ. And we are told in John 1, that Andrew ran off, ran off to tell Peter. We have found the Christ, John 1, Andrew's excitement just exudes off the pages of scripture. 
His excitement over Jesus reveals his emotion when he ran off to find Peter. It just tells us what he thought of Jesus. He believed that Jesus was the Messiah and he was emotional. In John 4.25, when, um, when Jesus was walking up from Judea, up through Samaria, he encountered a Samarian woman at the well. When the woman arrived at the well, he entered into a conversation with her. In that conversation, she informed Jesus um, that the Messiah was coming. Here is a Samaritan woman, and she knew that the Messiah was coming. She was looking forward to the Messiah. After the conversation was finished, we are told that she ran off to tell the city and told people that she had found the Messiah. The way she put it was, is this not the Christ? It is obvious that she thought Jesus was Christ. It is obvious that she wanted to tell people in the city that she had found the Christ. She was so excited about the fact that Jesus is the Christ. In John 7, we read on multiple occasions, people were asking about whether or not Jesus was the Christ. They asked again and again and again, is he the Christ? Is he, is he the Christ? Didn't the religious leaders know that he was the Christ? They were looking for the Christ. They were wondering who was the Christ. In John 10, 24, we are told that the religious leaders asked Jesus, are you the Christ? The nation was a buzz. The people were wondering. The people were wanting to know if Jesus was the Christ. Was he the Messiah? We are told that Peter confessed on one occasion that Jesus was the Christ. We are told in John eleven twenty seven that Martha declared that Jesus was the Christ. When we arrive at John 12, 34, we find that people were knowledgeable about the Christ. They knew what the coming Christ was supposed to be like. Well, at least they thought they did. Um, that tells us that there was great interest in the Messiah, the Christ. They were wanting to know. They were looking. They were waiting. There was great anticipation. And it reminds me of my waiting, my anticipation for Christmas morning. I wonder if that is the kind of anticipation, the kind of passion, the waiting, the emotion that they had. I cannot help but think that it was probably close. Jesus fulfilled ancient prophecy. In John 20, 31, the Apostle John writes, These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. John 20, 31. The Gospel of John was written that we might know that he is the Messiah. Now, why did John write the Gospel of John and say that the primary reason it was written was so that you might know that Jesus is the Messiah? Why would you do that if you were not excited that Jesus was the Messiah? The point is simple. They were interested in the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. And we should not be too surprised because the prophets of old had predicted that the Messiah was coming. In fact, in Romans 1, 2 through 4, we are told that the prophets predicted that Jesus, the Messiah, would be born and be a descendant of David. So when Mary was visited by Gabriel, the archangel in um, Luke 1, and Gabriel announced to Mary that she was going to be with child, he told her that the baby would be the Christ. Can you imagine what that what that must have um can you imagine what must have happened in Mary's heart um can you imagine her mixed emotions when the angel told her that she was going to be pregnant this is something that she had been looking forward to that is the coming of the Christ the Messiah um can you imagine the emotion in her heart and how about Elizabeth, who, after Mary tells her what has happened, responds with great joy. Then Elizabeth tells Mary that she is blessed among women. Now, the only reason she would say that is because she really believed Mary's pregnancy was truly a great thing. Elizabeth and Mary must have been so very excited, um, as they must have been two very excited women, as they contemplated what was going to happen. Then nine months went by nine months. Um, I can imagine Mary thinking about what was going to happen. 
Surely she went through all the thoughts about pregnancy and all the ins and outs of what that involves. I mean, can you imagine her anticipation? What Mary and Joseph did not know was that the years later, after Jesus was born, people would call the day of their baby's birth Christmas. It would be a day, a day to be celebrated. Christ is born in Jerusalem. Um, our study is in Luke chapter 2, so let's start at verse 1, as the great anticipation is in play. Little did the people of Jerusalem know that their Messiah was about to be born. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quintus was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to, Ju to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. These verses tell us very quickly that Mary and Joseph had to make a trip from Nazareth, um, from Nazareth up to Bethlehem. They had to make a trip because there was a decree, an order that they go to Bethlehem so that a census could be taken. Some people have said, was this really a census or was this a taxation? I think it was both. Um, our evidence indicates it was probably more than likely both a registration as well as a taxation. And so they had to leave Nazareth and make a trip um, up to Bethlehem. Now it's important to understand that Mary and Joseph were poor. We get that picture later on when Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Bethlehem to be dedicated where they offered two birds. According to the Mosaic, uh, Mosaic law, they were allowed to offer two, um, two birds if they were poor. If they were wealthier, they were to sacrifice an animal. Therefore, we get the picture that Mary and Joseph are poor. They are going through some difficult times emotionally, I'm sure, um, because of her pregnancy. We can imagine that she probably heard some criticism because she was pregnant out of wedlock. It was not exactly a great time to make this trip either because she is in the final days of her pregnancy. This was just not a good time to make the trip. And in verse 6, we find while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke chapter 2, 6 through 7. There are three Greek words that are translated as inn. The one that is used here has the idea of a guest room. It does not mean an inn, a motel, or a hotel such as we think of today. In this particular scenario, based upon more recent archaeological discoveries, we now know that the owner of the place would have lived on the top floor of two floors in this building. On the lower floor, there would have been an area for guests and also for animals. So when we are told that there was no room at the inn, substitute the word guest room, that would mean that there was no more room for guests. On this lower floor, there would have also been a place where the owner's animals could spend the night. Therefore, Mary and Joseph had to be with the cattle. That is where Jesus was born. When Christ was born, he was put into a manger or into a feeding trough. This was not a wonderful place for our Messiah, our Christ, to be born. The shepherds in Jerusalem... Um, now we come to verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. This verse tells us that it was nighttime. Um, we do not know uh, whether Jesus was born in the late afternoon or whether this was early night or maybe midnight. We, we don't really know. But whatever time of day it was, it was dark, we are told. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened or sore afraid. Luke chapter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> we often get a distorted view of how the angel appeared to the shepherds. 
Verse 9 says, the angel stood before them. The angel stood. The angel was not in the sky. The angel was standing before them on the ground. The angel stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them as they were terribly frightened. Now just imagine these shepherds. It's dark. There are, they're tending their sheep. We believe that they were tending sheep that were headed for sacrifice at the temple. Um, and all of a sudden, an angel stands before them. I think I would have been afraid. Verse 10 introduces the angels. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Notice that the angel says, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. He did not say, I bring you good news. He said, I bring you good news of great joy. Now, why would he add great joy? Obviously, he must have believed that his news was great and would bring joy. Obviously, heaven must have believed that it was good news. Because at the angel's announcement, there was reason for joy. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2 verse 11. That was and is good news of great joy. The one who was born is the Messiah. He was the one they had been waiting for. The one they had been looking for. The one they had been anticipating. They had been waiting and waiting and waiting and anticipating and now he was born. Angels give the shepherds a sign in verse 12. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Um, Luke chapter 2, verse 12. Have you ever wondered why the angel said it is a sign? Just imagine a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I do not know about you, but for years I would read that and ask, what is the big deal? It just sounds like a Christmas story. Since when are babies wrapped in diapers and lying in a manger a sign? And the answer is that back in those days, most poor parents could not afford clothes or diapers for their infants. In Christ's time, clothes were expensive. Only the wealthy people could afford what we call diapers. Um, for their infants. In Christ's time, cloths were expensive. Only the wealthy people could afford, could afford that. Um, obviously, there are consequences to that, but that was the way it was. Um, now, think about the manger. Perhaps the reason that Jesus was wrapped in cloths was that there were some guests who heard that a baby was born. There may have been some wealthy travelers who had some clothes, Maybe they had babies as well. They may have shared some cloths with Mary for Jesus. And remember, Mary and Joseph were poor. Now think about a baby wrapped in cloths that are normally used by a wealthy family, and he's lying in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. This is incredibly inconsistent. It did not make sense. Therefore, it was a sign. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Luke chapter 2, 13 through 14. Um, at this time of night, the city must have been quiet. No excitement, but this was about to change because in verse 15, we are told, When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known, made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. Luke chapter 2, 15 through 16. Now just think about the angel's message for a second. The shepherds were out in the field. There were probably 100 to 300 homes in the area of Bethlehem. How are they going to find this baby? They probably went from one house to another, um, to another house, to another house, getting the people in the community very excited. Each time they went to a house, they asked about this baby. And I can imagine the shepherds going up to one house and saying, hey, do you know where the baby is that's wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger? 
Do you know where he is? I can imagine the questions. Um, I can imagine the interest that occurred in that community. And finally, they found him. Verse 17, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this Christ, about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. Luke chapter 2, 17 through 18. The people were abuzz. The city was abuzz. The whole region was alive with interest about the birth of Christ. Verse 19 tells us that Mary was also. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Um, angels were filled with great joy. Just imagine the emotion in the community. But not just the community, not just Mary, and not just Joseph were excited about the birth of Christ. There was someone else whom we often overlook. No, I should not say someone. I should say a group of angels. The angels had been waiting and anticipating the birth of Christ. And you can say, wait a minute, how do you know that? Well, the answer is found in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the scripture um, or, or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11. These two verses are very simple. It says that the prophets had prophesied. The prophets were seeking to know about the time Christ would come. And verse 12 adds, It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. 1 Peter 1, 12. Do you know what the prophets were told? God let the prophets know that they were not writing for themselves, but for us. The prophets were writing for the people in the future and not for themselves. Now notice the last part of verse 12. Things into which angels long to look. 1 Peter 1, 12. So do you see what it says? Things into which angels long to look. The Greek word for long is epithemio. Epithemio. Epithmio. It has the idea of great emotion or great desire. It is sometimes translated as lust to give you a flavor of the emotion involved or to care for or covet. This is a strong word involving emotion. So we are told that the angels longed to look. The word that is translated to um, as to look is the Greek word for perikipko. Uh, Parakipto. Um, it has the idea of one stooping and stretching the neck in order to gaze at some wonderful sight. Um, I have a picture of angels in heaven looking over, stooping down, looking down to earth to see. The word has the idea of stooping to look. It has the idea of tremendous interest. We have two very powerful Words put together strong emotion with a tremendous desire to understand. That describes the attitude of the angels. There are two very important points to take away from this verse. The first is that the prophets wanted to know, and the angels also. Not just the prophets, but the angels wanted, the angels wanted to know. Think back to Daniel 9, 20 through 27. Earlier in Daniel 9, the prophet Daniel had been asking God for an understanding of a passage of scripture. Consequently, Gabriel, the archangel, was sent to Daniel to give him the answer. When Gabriel arrived, he gave Daniel the answer, which is recorded in verses 20 through 27. In that passage, there is a prophecy about the time Jesus would come, when the Messiah would arrive. And do you know what that tells me? It tells me that the angels understood at that point in time when the Messiah would arrive. The second takeaway is that the angels have emotion. Think about this, angels longing to look. The angels long to look. Think about angels having emotion. Angels are now um, not some sterile group or like Spock on Star Trek. Luke 15.10 tells us that the angels rejoice when sinners repent. 
this means that angels have emotion. <sighs> the angels are excited when people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Therefore, we know that these angels who knew when Christ would arrive were excited about what was happening. They were emotional about his birth. And just think for a moment with me, Gabriel probably, we don't know for sure, but I tend to believe that Gabriel was thrilled about the announcement that he gave to Mary. He had the opportunity to share the name by which this baby would be called, Jesus, the Christ. Um, think about Gabriel's emotions. How about the joy of the multitude of angels who announced that there would be peace among men with whom God is pleased? I believe they enjoyed giving the announcement to the shepherds. The angels longed to look. The angels wanted to know. The angels participated from the very beginning of Christmas on earth to the very end. The angels were involved in the announcement of Jesus' birth. The angels were involved in ministering to Jesus at his temptation. The angels were at the grave when Jesus was resurrected. They greeted the woman, um, the women, and the angels were at his ascension in Acts 1.10. The angels watch us, 1 Corinthians 4.9. Hebrews 1.14 tells us that they minister to us. The angels have been involved in the plan of salvation from the beginning to the end. In Ephesians 3.10, we are told that God revealed his grace of salvation to the angels through the church. The angels were looking. They are still looking and they are still wanting to know more. <sighs> Though the angels will never experience redemption, the book of Revelation contains a fascinating portrayal of their interest in it. And he, Christ the Lamb, came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God when your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. With your blood, with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were myrads of myrads, and thousands and thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation 5, 7 through 12. The holy angels will join the song of redemption, even though they have not experienced salvation. They have been witnesses to the greatness of God's salvation, and they long to look. They desire to know. When Jesus was born, it was an awesome event here on earth. It was great news, and the great news was what? First, that the Messiah was born. Second, that the great news, um, second, the great news is that peace is available to men with whom he is pleased. It always fascinates me. Every time I look at Christmas cards in the store, it has peace and goodwill among men on the front or inside of the car, um, of the front or inside inside of the card and that is exactly what the biblical text says the verse the verse says peace among men with whom he is well pleased think about Zechariah in Luke 1 79 at the very end of the verse we are told that the Messiah will guide our path into the way of peace Jesus tells us that he came to bring peace not as the world gives he does not offer peace carte blanche um, his peace is not escape from suffering, anxiety, war, struggles, and trials in this life. That is not the kind of peace Jesus came to give. Jesus said the kind of peace he gives is not the kind of peace in which the world is interested. In Acts 10, 36, we are told that peace is through Jesus. In Isaiah 9, 6, we are told that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. In Romans 5, 1, we are told that we can have peace the kind of peace that the angels were talking about, the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about, and it is peace with God. 
Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. And the verse goes on to tell us that peace is acquired through faith. Did you know that peace is acquired through faith? Peace with God is acquired by faith. It is not something you do. It's not by your work. It's not by your activity. It is by faith. It is by believing that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the fulfillment of the prophecies, and he is the one who came and died for our sins. The angels were interested in the plan of salvation. They were interested in what it was all about. They were interested in his birth as well as his death, his resurrection, his ascension. They were interested in all of it. They wanted to know, and they still want to know. They are still interested. They are still learning. There is still a song whose lyrics are, He is our peace, who has broken down every wall. He is our peace. He is our peace. He is our peace. Who has broken down every wall? He is our peace. He is our peace. I mean, get the point? He is our peace. Um, he is our peace who has broken down every wall. He is the Prince of Peace. Jesus came to offer peace. Jesus came to give us peace. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. He gives us spiritual peace by forgiving our sins when we believe in him. It requires that we believe that we are a sinner. It requires that we put our faith in Jesus Christ as the only one who can forgive us of all our sins. It requires that we are repentant of our sin. These are the ones who find peace with God. These are the ones who find real peace. Ultimately, we will have peace in heaven. We will be free from sin, free from war, free from suffering, and free from anxiety. It will be peace in the broadest and best sense of the word. Jesus brought joy on Christmas. Joy. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good, no good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. A bit of joy will do, but great joy. Is it almost too much to hope for? Where did all the Christmas joy go? How did things get so complicated, so rushed, so squeezed and cluttered? It does not have to be that way. We can choose to step aside, step into the quieter moment, and read angels' words that come on that night that changed the world. Just another night of work in the field for the shepherds. A chill in the air with serenity and boredom. Another night of work like a thousand nights before, just like a thousand years before when David was just a boy and stood watching in the same fields. Life hasn't changed in a millennium, and then everything would change in a single night. When the angel appeared, beaming with a glorious light that could only be the glory of God himself, those men and boys who were used to fending off wild beasts to protect their sheep were reduced to terror. Were they convinced by the simple words, I bring you great news of great joy? Probably not. Um, joy would have to come later. They would have to see the proof itself. That's the way it works with joy. Real joy is never something that originates from within. It has to come from, um, it has to come to us from without. Trying to find joy by getting it out of yourself is like believing a river can flow uphill. Maybe that's one of the reasons why so many have a hard time finding joy at Christmas. Um, bite into a Christmas cookie and you might enjoy it. Open a shiny package and you might enjoy what you find inside. But joy itself, in its true and pure form, is so much more than enjoyment. Joy is the startling realization that God really has claimed territory in this world. He's taken back what belongs to him. And then joy is a thirst that doesn't want to be quenched, a hunger that knows it will go on and on. It's a good thing to never get enough of God. 
And best of all, this joy about a royal entry into the world is great because it is everywhere. A joy that will be for all the people right here, right now. That means me. And it means you. Peace. <clears throat> Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Luke chapter 2, 13 through 14. Peace is a notable aspiration at any time. When the world is at war, or when wars seem to have settled down, when you find yourself in battle with someone else, or when you are feeling pretty good about your relationships, um, when you're confident that you are on the same side as God, and when you're not so sure, there is a time when it is not good to pursue peace. But peace is so much more than the absence of conflict. Maybe you can lay your head on your pillow tonight and thank God that nobody beat you up today. But that is not the same thing as expressing peace. If a husband and wife get tired of shouting at each other and slip into a mutually agreed upon icy indifference, that's not peace. In Hebrew, the word for peace is shalom, a kind of well-wishing that says it all. May you be healthy, whole, complete. May you know where you fit in in the universe and may you have tranquility in that. Augustus, um, Augustine said that Peace is the tranquility of order. When you know where you fit into God's world, that you are more than a beast, but less than God, that is the sense of order that brings tranquility. And so we wish for peace at Christmas, which includes the hope that somehow fewer people will be killed by bullies or hunger or AIDS. But it goes beyond that. Christmas shalom is the confidence that when God's favor, his undeserved grace rests on us, we will know a peace that goes beyond understanding, the peace that comes because Christ came into the world and put things in order, beginning with his birth, completed in his sacrifice, death, and triumphant resurrection. Let's talk about the angel, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 20 through 21. In the dictionary, um, angel um, definition is a typically benevolent celestial being that acts as an intermediary between heaven and earth. What really was Gabriel to Mary? What kind of being came with foreknowledge of a supernatural conception and with words that would change her identity forever? Greetings, you, are, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. How would the shepherds have described the angel with the glory of the Lord shining about and then a great company of the heavenly host whose voices poured out a chorus like a tidal wave, glory to God in the highest. What would J um, Joseph say about his encounter with an angel or what would Zechariah, John the Baptist's father say in the days leading up to the birth of Jesus, supernatural appearance and utterances um, were occurring like they had never had before. Heaven's communication was electric. The real meaning of angel is, sim is simply messenger. And that reminds us that Christmas is about a message. It is gospel, good news, the best news. Powerful spiritual messengers whose very presence struck fear and awe in people, not pudgy winged cherubs here, um, were paving the way. Their mission and their message transformed human beings. They never left people the way they had been. Now, any of us this year can probably think of a dozen ways we would like to hear a word from a messenger of God sent just to us. And we do have that message. 
it is a message best suited to each of us because it was sent to all of us. Jesus will save people from their sins. <clears throat> God sent the angel. <clears throat> God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, um, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Luke 1, 26 through 31. Is there anyone in the history of the world who was asked to have more faith than Mary? She was young. She was a virgin. She was probably expecting her days to continue to follow the course of a normal life in a no-name Galilean town in an era that didn't even know it was an era. And then came the message from heaven to be visited by an angel. That would be enough. But the words, those troubling, confusing, ineffable words, the Lord is with you. Yes, certainly that's true of all of us, generally speaking. But in this case, the emphasis was the Lord is with you. The God who chooses had made another choice. As with Abraham and Moses and Isaiah and Ruth and David, God chose his instrument to do his work in the world. High favor indeed. You will be with child in a way that no woman before or since has been with child, a virgin, and yet with child. <sighs> Is that too hard to believe? Is it too much to ask 21st century people to believe that there was one day when God did something not too hard for him to do, not too complicated to understand, but utterly unique? Is it too hard for the creator of the universe to cause a woman to have, by an act of creation, a complete zygote which would become an embryo, which would become a fetus, which would become a newborn baby. No, the virginal conception is only too hard to believe if you think that the Creator can never do anything just once. But who can make up such a rule for God? Mary must not be worshipped, but she must not be ignored. She stands at the crossroads between the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New. She was asked to believe something that none of us could ever imagine. And in her whole life, from stable to cross, she pointed to Jesus. Stop and ask yourself this question. If Mary were here today, how would she celebrate Christmas? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night. Luke 2, 8. It may seem like a stretch of a question, but try it anyway. If you were God and could announce the arrival of the Savior of humanity on the very night, would you send your messengers to some shepherds out in the field, whiling away their nighttime watch? Doesn't it seem like a waste? Why not send angels to an assembly of the religious council in Jerusalem? Why not to the megalomanic King Herod to put him in his place um, in an instant. How about Caesar? Wouldn't that be a night of work to blow open the doorway of society, to march right in and change everything? But instead it was shepherds, rough characters at that time. Those laborers did the tedious things a lot of other people would have been unwilling to do. They smelled of the flocks and were used to sleeping on the hard ground. There was a link, of course, a golden thread that connected the town of Bethlehem and two shepherds who had lived a millennium apart. When David was at his best as king of Israel, and he had many less than good chapters in his life, um, he acted as the shepherd king. He cared for the people, just like he cared for the sheep when he was a boy watching sheep in the fields outside Bethlehem. David David could write the incredible words of Psalm 23 
because he knew what it meant to be a good shepherd. And he knew that God was his good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And that isn't all. He guides, he protects with his rod and staff. Jesus, the son of David, came to be the good shepherd. When Jesus spoke about it in John 10, he said that he knows us as his sheep and we are to know him. He promised that he would defend us from wolves and not run away. But most important, he said that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So consider this. On the night when Jesus began in this world, an inexorable process was set into motion, leading to the day he would lay down his life for the world. That's what a true shepherd does. So an angelic vision to Bethlehem shepherds, men who understand feeding and guiding and saving, seems like the best way for the chapter one to begin. Let's talk about Joseph. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Matthew 1, 18 through 19. We, don't, we know so little about him, the father of Jesus. Joseph probably died long before Jesus' adult ministry because he is only mentioned in the birth and childhood stories of Jesus, named after the ancient patriarch who used his success in Egypt to save his family and future nation. This Joseph was a carpenter who lived in the town of Nazareth. It may have been that some great-great-grandfather had moved from Bethlehem in Judea up to the north where Jews at that time were establishing their presence among the pagans of Galilee. So when a Roman ruler called Caesar Augustus wanted a census, Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem, though his wife was well along in her pregnancy. The most important thing we know about Joseph is that at the right moment in his life, he was full of faith and grace. He found out that the woman he was engaged to be married to was pregnant. And though Mary had the benefit of the message of an angel who explained her unique conception, Joseph hadn't been visited yet. All he had was Mary's word. So what was that conversation like? No, she hadn't slept with another man. Yes, she was pregnant. And yes, a spiritual being had told her that she would conceive by a unique act of God. And if that wasn't enough, the child in her womb would be the savior of the people. Why did Joseph believe her? Why did he change his first plans to quietly divorce her so as not to expose her to public shame? Engagements were so serious then, to break one off amounted to a divorce, and instead take her as his wife, and then abstain from sexual relations with her until the birth of the child. <sighs> if I was in, my sh um, was in his shoes, would I have believed Mary? Here is something for all of us to think about at Christmas. Think of Joseph. Think of him looking into Mary's eyes, hearing her account, knowing in his heart of hearts it was true, and having the courage to act on that faith knowledge, even though he may have had doubts. As nonsensical as it seemed, he believed it, as much as the idea of a virginal conception violates every norm of what we know about real life, he knew it was possible with God. As risky as it was to stay with Mary and be branded by others as the harpless dupe of an of an immoral woman, Joseph decided to put everything on the line. That is true faith, and it is true grace. It wasn't just that he believed Mary, he believed God, that God could, that God might, that God would. <sighs> he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. 
His kingdom will never end. Luke 1, 32 through 33. Christmas represents a beginning that only makes sense if we comprehend the end. The beginning was a baby. The beginning was quiet humility in an earthly stable, but the end, the end is the explosion of divine glory, bright enough for the whole world to see, like a hydrogen bomb without the destruction. The end is a kingdom. Jesus came not just for the moment of purity that his birth brought about, but to move toward the kingdom of God, introducing people to it and bringing it as the central reality of their lives. His kingdom will never end. What Herod didn't understand was that by killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem, he was not protecting his kingdom, but showing how weak and pitiful it was. All human power will slip from human hands like water dribbling out of, a, out of cupped hands, though they try to hold it. But the kingdom of Christ is different. It will never end. There is no rival to his authority, though people will continue to disbelieve in it. There is no one sitting at the right hand of God this very moment except him. No other authority was there when the earth was created and will be there when the final judgment comes. Don't ever think that Christmas is a way for us to wrap God up in a package, put a bow on it, and keep the whole thing under our control. A way for us to avoid God, except for those extra special religious seasons. The first Christmas was the, was the arrival of a king. Rulers from the east knew it, so they came to present gifts. King Herod knew it, so he tried murder. It is the Battle of Bethlehem, the beginning of a war in which the King of Kings is intent to take back territory that belonged to him all along and to liberate captives like you and me. She wrapped him in cloths and put him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Luke 2, 7. Where is the first place you place a baby after it emerges from the mother's womb and after a few moments of lying against its mother's chest? Today we use super sterile blankets and sanitized cribs, a plexiglass dome if necessary. All precautions go towards minimizing the germs the child may come into contact with. Um, emerging into the world means being isolated from the world. But Mary laid Jesus in the feeding trough for, um, for an animal. The good shepherd took refuge that night in the sheep's manger, and while the shepherds came to see what was announced to them, how stunned they must have been. Of course, this would not have been Mary and Joseph's first choice. They would have preferred a modest room at a local inn, but the no vacancy sign was put out for the night. Um, if it all took place today, maybe a red neon light would have flashed a big no that made a ghastly pool of light on the asphalt of the parking lot. There are times when no is the hardest thing we have to hear. Yet Jesus has seen and continues to see the no sign from the human race, which he had a hand in creating. Many don't even want to consider him. Even in the life of a faithful believer, um, there is so much in us that wants to say to him, stay out of that part of my life. Keep that door closed. No, you may not spend the night. So instead, he stays where he can. A feeding trough will do. Not protected from the world, but lying in it. She will grieve, I mean, sorry, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Luke 2, 7. Sometimes a name is just a name and sometimes it is a perfect description of reality. The ancients were much more inclined than we are to choose names carefully so as to make a lifelong statement about a person's identity. Jesus is a name so familiar to us, it could easily escape our notice that it was an ordinary name with extraordinary significance that an angel announced should be the name of Mary and Joseph's new child. And what a name. Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Yeshua in Hebrew. He does indeed. 
um, call him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. You can't say that about any little Joshua. Um, none of us can save ourselves any more than a person sinking in a rowboat can save themselves by pulling up on the side of the boat. We don't need to wait until Good Friday and Easter to celebrate the Savior. The saving started at the birth of Jesus. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Luke 2, 11. Some people think that Christ is Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ, like Joe Johnson or Audrey Smith. And if you have thought that, don't feel bad. It is just evidence that over the centuries, our understanding of Jesus as the Christ has become so solid in our thinking that we don't think of Jesus without Christ. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Among all the titles he bears, Son of God, Son of Man, Good Shepherd, Alpha and Omega, it all begins in the gospel story with this one incredible announcement. The baby born on an ordinary day in Bethlehem was the Messiah, the Anointed One. He is Christ the Lord. Christos in Greek, Messiah in Hebrew, Anointed One in English. The name means one with the divine designation to split all of history between this age and the age to come. The one and only, the beginning of all, and the conclusion of all. But what is the meaning of anointed one? In the Old Testament, kings were anointed, as were priests and prophets. And so when we hear Christ, our minds should spin around like a compass seeking its orientation, landing on Jesus, the king who rules over a different kind of kingdom, ruling in people's lives, not just because they are in his realm, but because he is in their hearts. The priest, um, one who stands between God and humanity, one who sacrifices, one who intercedes, the mediator, the bridge. And he is a prophet too. Prophets had brought the words of God to the people, but the Messiah is the word of God to the people. In those days, with the he um, when the heavy hand of Caesar Augustus gripped the land of promise, people were looking for the anointed one to come. They were hoping for a large army, not a multitude of heavenly hosts. They assumed a bigger and better David, not an obscure rabbi wrapped in rumor of magic and charisma who always seemed like an outsider when he visited Jerusalem. They probably expected an orat um, orator or the speeches of this Messiah, um, but the speeches of this Messiah left people speechless. The very best thing God does in our lives usually come as a surprise to us. So wouldn't it be surprising if we who think we know so much about Jesus and who presume to be on a last name basis would be startled to see him in a whole new way, not stuck in a nativity set or merely documented in hymns, but the real live manifestation of God on earth. This, the angel said, was good news of great joy. What could be better than God landing in the midst of our lives? So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David, Luke 2, 4. It could have been called any town because Bethlehem was like any town in the halls of Judea, except that... Um, <laughs> The greatest king um, of Israel, David, was born there. And then a thousand years later, the Messiah. How does such honor come to the ordinary? Were the people of this town particularly worthy? Was there some great strategic advantage of where it lay? Were the people of Bethlehem politically savvy, having a great Jerusalem just six miles to the north? Even the meaning of Bethlehem, house of bread, is unremarkable. What we know is that hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Micah predicted the destiny of any town. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The townspeople of Bethlehem were surely proud to be the town of David and the home of his, famous, um, of his famous grandmother, Ruth. 
they must have been glad too that the tomb of Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife, was there. And they must have wondered what Micah's prophecy really meant. When would another prophet like Samuel come to town and anoint a new king, just like he had done with the boy David? But it didn't happen that way. On an ordinary day, when men plied their trades and women baked bread and children played in the streets, a traveling couple from Nazareth arrived looking for a room. They got no special treatment. No one offered their own room. Ordinary people were having an ordinary response to an ordinary looking couple. Honor comes to the ordinary because of God's choice, whether it is God's choice to use a town or a nation or even a single man or woman, boy or girl. So if this is shaping up to be an ordinary day for you, then be prepared. That's the stage on which um, the acts of God are played. <sighs> All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1, 22 through 23. If you've ever lost one of your kids, um, I once lost a child once um, walking through a crowded tourist town where the streets were lined with shops. In the evening, the crowds were dense and suddenly you notice that your child's not with you and a quick scan doesn't reveal them. <sighs> then you remember that they had skipped along into a toy store, but um, you also just pa passed a side street that was lined with shops and throngs of people so she could be anywhere. And a few minutes of running around and somehow you you spot her way down the side street and the look on her face is just unforgettable. Where were you? Were the words, but the eyes said, thank God you are with me now. I am never going to leave your side again. If you've ever experienced um, some form of that, then you understand. With us. There is hardly a more central promise that God has ever made to human beings. The alternatives are just too horrifying to imagine. If God has abandoned us, and that is why so many bad things happen in life, then what does that say about God? And what does it say about our destiny? Um, if God facilitates willing to be with us only as long as we don't get too obnoxious, coming and going like a father who keeps giving up on being a father, where does that leave us? If God is incapable of being with us, then we have to conclude that we will never reap the benefits of divine um, presence and words like grace, mercy, love, and truth have no meaning. Isaiah was the prophet who was given the message in a time when Israel's enemies were bearing down on them. He gave this startling oracle about the Lord giving a sign. A virgin would conceive and give birth and the promise in the child Emmanuel, God will be with us. Jesus was born, but he was sent and Emmanuel was one of his names, God with us. That was why so many people didn't understand him. His voice came from a different place. He turned life upside down with truths that he presented. But he also left people with the sense that they had never been closer to God than when they were with him. We don't need to stay lost. God is not indifferent to our condition. And he came to us in the most radical way by taking our flesh, our humanity, on himself. Luke 2, 46 through 47 says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. We live in an age of sinking souls, which is the perfect reason to take Christmas seriously as our best hope for our minds and hearts to be enlarged with God's greatness. Mary's response to the message that she would bear the one who would be the savior was a remarkable song of praise, sometimes known as the Magnificent. Luke 2, 46, through 50, uh, 46 and 55, it begins with, My soul magnifies the Lord, which means that because God's announcement opened her heart to God in a way that she couldn't have imagined, now her soul was beginning to grasp the bigness of God. 
sometimes human beings look at God as if he were a distant point of light, but then his word comes along, a sober statement of his intent to do something in our history, and if we accept it by faith, our lives become larger. We see that we are living in a greater reality, with a greater God than we had imagined and with greater possibilities in our future. Mary knew her life would never be the same, not just her life, but the lives of countless others because of what God was going to do, and it stretched her soul. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, verse 6. What is the baby's name? Many people in Bethlehem who heard of a baby born in a stable must have stopped by to talk to Mary or Joseph, who might have had a shudder every time they voiced the name that they themselves had not chosen, Jesus. But hundreds of years earlier, other names had already been announced for the Anointed One. Isaiah spoke of one who would be called Wonderful Counselor. One of the roles of a king or other highly placed official in ancient times was that of counselor. The most difficult questions, the most complicated negotiations, the most intractable problems were presented to someone who was supposed to be wise and judicious because of his high position. The counsel of the king was supreme. But then we know there is good counsel and there is poor counsel. The one born of a virgin would be called Wonderful Counselor. Now that is something different. The Hebrew word for wonderful means something out of the ordinary, clearly different, beyond human expl explanation. It is the kind of knowledge spoken of in Psalm 136. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar you discern my goings out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. O oh Lord, you hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. When we think of the nativity of Jesus, there is one overwhelming sense that we should have about it all. Wonder. God coming right to us in that way. Wonderful. Jesus giving us an unclouded vision of what our lives are supposed to be. Good counsel. Wonderful. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Government. Does that word strike a positive note in you or negative? Of course, we're used to complaints about government because governing almost always fell, um, falls into the hands of imperfect people who build their own kingdoms and bureaucracies, and then they become ends unto themselves, and government becomes a massive monster needing to be fed to stay alive. And the food is sometimes people's lives. Worse yet, some forms of governing are tyranny in which a um, despot imposes rules designed only to build up his power, control, and treasure. It's a shame that government has gotten such a bad name because we all need it. The ungoverned life is chaos, anarchy, and injustice. With no governing, people would not volunteer to pitch in for common good, and they would be unwilling to enact laws that impinge on their prerogatives. And so government is a necessary constraint on our impulses and independence a way for a person to say, I need to have standards in my life, and I know I and my neighbors need to live under those standards for them to be meaningful. God knows we need governing. That's why he calls himself king, 
shepherd, master, lord, father. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the world gained the greatest governor the world had ever known. Have you ever looked at someone with the responsibility of governing and wondered how he or she can bear up under the sheer weight of the responsibility? Though there's good news here, the government will be on his shoulders. Governing real, life-shaping authority ultimately rests on Christ's shoulders. Now, there is a future time when he will reign as indisputed ruler, but in the meantime, he is exercising considerable governing power. Since Bethlehem, the world has changed. It is not that evil has disappeared, but its counter, the power of Christ, has been triumphant in one life after another. And we can thank God this Christmas that he did not leave us to our chaotic, ungoverned state. A shepherd king came to stand in the, um, the Davidic line, not to be like other kings, but to govern our lives from the inside out. And he will be called Mighty God, Isaiah 9, 6. Some of the prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament are mysterious statements that are so bold, so large, that they were held as treasures across the generations until they were fulfilled and then understood. Isaiah's oracle about a son who would be born, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, and all the rest was one of those landmark promises. And in that moment of inspiration, Isaiah, Isaiah revealed the would-be mighty God. Now, in the Jewish tradition, nothing was more important than belief in the oneness of God. Not two gods, not a thousand gods, but one and only one God. So what could happen when in Bethlehem itself, Magi from the east came bearing gifts fit for a king, but who also worshipped him? Why did Jesus allow fishermen in a boat to worship him after he calmed a storm, or Mary falling at Jesus' feet in worship in the garden after his resurrection, or the disciple Thomas falling at Jesus' feet seeing, saying, my Lord, my God. Nobody at the start of Jesus' life, nor during his adult ministry, even hinted at anything suggesting there is more than one God. But because of who God is, and because God is higher than human comprehension, and because God said, us from the very beginning. Let us make man in our image. And because the coming one would be called Emmanuel, God with us, we can believe that Christmas represents the true entry of God into human affairs. The same God who created humanity took humanity on himself when it suited his purpose to save that same humanity. Not any kind of God would do that. Only the one, the true, the mighty God. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 9, 6, and he will be called Everlasting Father. What a remarkable string of names in this one verse, Isaiah 9, 6. This child who was born, this son who was given, is known by what he was called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, and then Everlasting Father. Now, this was a radical statement indeed. A coming ruler might, if he were an ordinary ruler, simply assert his authority and prerogatives as a potentate. Um, and everybody knows that the king is the one who has the power because he has an army and who has wealth because he controls the resources of that realm. That is the way of earthly rulers. But Jesus would be no more, um, no mere earthly ruler. His reign would be everlasting. That means enduring, unstoppable, without challenge. And it also means having the qualities of heaven. An everlasting king would have to be a divine king. It is a different kind of king who reigns as father. Kings, or for that matter, prime ministers or presidents, don't have to be fathers. They can wield power simply because they have it. But a ruler who cares for those in his realm, who truly wants to protect and provide for his subjects out of a familial kind of love is as much a father as a king. We don't need to be confused about Jesus being called everlasting father. Here, 
As if this confuses the doctrine of the Trinity, hundreds of years before his birth, Jesus was called Everlasting Father, simply because the reign would be about protecting and providing a king, yes, but a fatherly one. And we should not forget that Jesus' relationship with God the Father was so close that Jesus could say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In some parts of the world, the legend of Santa Claus, derived from St. Nicholas, is called Father Christmas. And at its best, the legend expresses the hope that someone bigger than life out there is full of benevolence and magical charm, but nothing can compare with the reality that Jesus Christ has become for the world, the powerful protector and perfect provider, a king whose authority is so right and so good that it will never end. Born a child, destined to bring fatherly care, always and forever. And he will be called Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. Princes, whether they desire it or not, usually end up as warriors. Rulers of nations may talk about peace, but nothing is more elusive than peace. And so when Isaiah talked about a child who would be born, a son who would be given, who would be called the Prince of Peace, it sounded like high rhetoric, wishful thinking, but could it ever possibly happen? When you look at the life of Jesus, it hardly looks like a life of peace. He was in constant conflict with people who had invented their own ideas about God and with people who really didn't want God to meddle in their affairs at all. Jesus had enemies, and in the end, he died a most violent death, preceded by humiliating abuse. His followers were harassed and persecuted. Fishermen ended up as martyrs. Yet it is in the very sacrifice of Jesus that he became Prince of Peace. Only when the chief enemies of humanity were defeated would it be possible for people to live at peace with God, with themselves, and with the world. And so, yes, he was the Prince of Peace. The angel was right in saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. The Apostle Paul could pass on a sincere wish for peace in saying, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 This is the kind of prince, a ruler, brand new to the world, that the prophecy pointed to. So when we think of Bethlehem, we must remember that it was not the stable that made this baby unique, nor the virtues of Mary or Joseph, nor the angelic presence, nor any other feature of those extraordinary days. Jesus is Prince because of who he is. Even as a baby, his presence was a new force for peace in the world. Where do you need to find peace in your life at this time? After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Matthew 2, 1 through 2. Mary and Joseph apparently stayed in Bethlehem many months after the birth of Jesus, yet we know nothing about that time. How was Mary treating her baby, knowing she would have to submit to him as her Lord? How much attention were they getting from the townspeople? What were they telling people, if anything? We just don't know. But we do know that one day some travelers from the east, maybe Persia or Mesopotamia, the regions of modern-day Iran or Iraq, suddenly showed up in Bethlehem, claiming to have been guided to a new king by a star. The word magi refers to people who belonged to some kind of priestly caste who specialized in special, um, special knowledge, interpretation of dreams, and astrology. Despite popular traditions, they were not kings. We don't know their names, and we don't know that there were three of them. That is a tradition inferred from the fact that they bore three gifts, gold, incense, and myrrh. There may have been two, there may have been twelve, but what we do know of them is startling. They saw a sign. They were motivated. They traveled. No wonder they are sometimes called wise men. They were not merely astrologers. They were worshipers. Jerusalem was their first stop where they inquired about a new king. 
which is a sure way to um, set off the alarm with the existing king. Um, but then they found Bethlehem. They delivered their valuable gifts and they bowed in worship. If people in Bethlehem weren't paying much attention before, then they surely were now. They were as foreign as could be, but Jesus was of keen interest to them. These are the stories that remind us that fam familiarity can breed contempt, that if we are not careful, we who are insiders can consider Christ and Christmas so familiar that we pass them with a simple nod of the head. No, if men from afar, away in the east, went out of their way to find him and to set treasures before him, then maybe one of the best things we can do um, at retail obsessed Christmas season is to think, what gifts will I bring him? They went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Matthew 2, 9-10 through 10. It says in Psalm 19 that stars above have voices. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour fresh, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voices is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. If you have ever stood outside in the black night and looked up at the canopy of stars away from the city, away from the noise, it may have seemed to you like the stars have a message. In silence, they speak and their voice is thunderous. The star of Bethlehem, a sign in the sky noted by the Magi, may have been a miraculous event matching the miraculous entry of the Savior into the world, or it may have been a natural astronomical phenomenon used by God as a sign. In either case, the point is that the heavens were speaking when Christ was born in a unique, in a unique way about a unique world-changing event should that come as any surprise? But note that only the observant recognized the sign. God drew outsiders towards Bethlehem with a word that he had placed in the sky. Don't ever doubt that God is speaking to the outsider and that those who seek will find. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John 1, 14. The point is not so much that the Son of God became a baby, but that he became flesh. And in this humbling of the eternal Son of God, the Word, who was with God from the beginning and was God, he chose to begin in the way all flesh does as a newborn. But what does flesh really mean? It sounds a bit crass, uh, maybe a bit sinful. In the Bible, flesh is a word that points to a number of different realities, literally. It means the body, the tissues and bones and fluids that are common to any human being living anywhere in the world at any time. The body is the jar of clay in which God has placed treasures. Consequently, flesh can mean humanity or human nature. To speak of flesh and blood refers to the humanness that you share with your family and friends and people you've never met. And then flesh can mean fallen, flawed humanity. The flesh is shorthand in Paul's epistles for humanity as it always is, broken and fallible, with one exception, and that is Christ. The word became flesh. It means that the Son of God became human, really, truly human, um, with the exception that he had no sin. Christmas is a time of awe because the best news the human race ever got was that its creator had so much love that he joined the human race to save it. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Um, Luke chapter 2, verse 30 through 32. There was less light yesterday than any other day of the year. The winter solstice on December 21st means for many of us who live halfway
between the equator and the North Pole that we have breakfast when it is still dark outside, and by supper the sun has long set. That slide toward the shortest day of the year seems like sinking into a black hole. No wonder people in ancient cultures thought that the day when the sun started coming back was reason to celebrate. The prophet Malachi spoke of the healing power of light. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Malachi 4.2 we're getting closer to the shortest day. We're getting closer and closer. Um, eight days after Jesus' birth, when Mary and Joseph had taken him to the temple as the, as the law required, a man named Simeon saw him, and his eyes were opened to the reality of Jesus' identity. His eyes saw God's salvation there in human form, at the right place at the right time, brought in not by royalty, but by an ordinary couple. Yet Simeon knew this was it, and he saw in Jesus a brilliant light that would show the way, not just for Israel, but for all the nations. Days were dark then. It was hard to know when deliverance might come from the heavy grip of the Romans. War was always just a rumor away. It was difficult to settle into a normal pattern of living when on a whim an emperor in a faraway land could demand a census that sent you packing your bags. Days are dark now, not just because it's December, but because the black hole of evil has been drawing people in. But darkness will never be able to deny light. It will never be able to say, I am the real thing and light is an illusion. Because as everybody knows, darkness is only the absence of light. We need to see salvation here and now. We need to use this Christmas as much as ever before to look at the one who has been prepared in the sight of all people, the public savior, the beacon for the world, the light for revelation, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, that we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 2, beginning, the beginning. How much we all want to know about the beginning of all things so that we can understand the now of all things and pursue the way things are supposed to be in the now. We assume that the right way to live is defined by the divine origins and designs for life. And we are right in this. Um, the Bible's opening words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mark the, um, mark the line between a time when there was only God and the beginning of the existence of his magnificent creation, including mankind. And the opening words of the Gospel of John place the Son of God right there at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Unlike every other human birth that has ever happened, the birth of Jesus was not the beginning of a new life. Rather, someone who was there at the beginning appeared, as it says in um, 1 John 1, 1 through 2, and this appearance was not a dream or vision or apparition. The appearance was an extended visitation, a flood of revelation all lived in a real life. The life appeared. It was heard. It was seen. It was touched. Bethlehem was not the beginning of the life of Christ, and that's why his life can change our lives. Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. What was new at Bethlehem was the way God reached out to the human race. Whereas in the past, God spoke through the words of the prophets, a new God speech began at Bethlehem. God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Hebrews uh, 1, verse 2 through 3. So Christmas is about the good beginning, and it is about the rescue of the now, a new contact with the human race by one who has been there all along. 
while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Luke um, chapter 2 verse 6. On the night before Jesus was born, the shepherds would have seen the night sky the way they had seen it a thousand times before without a hint that they would witness an angelic company. On the night before Christmas, in the year 1968, three men looked into the night sky also, but from an entirely different perspective. Frank Borman, Jim Lavelle, and William Anders, the crew of Apollo 8, were further away from the Earth than any human being had been. It was the first time a spacecraft had broken Earth's orbit and ventured out across a quarter million miles to orbit. For the first time ever, the moon. On a historical broadcast on that Christmas Eve, the astronauts beamed back to Earth a video picture of a small blue disk, which was the Earth, and spoke of the vast loneliness of space. And then their voices crackled over the radio. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. There on that small blue circle is where the whole drama of human history had unfolded. The creation, the fall, wars, um, explorations, feasts and famine, marriage and divorce, births and deaths, and to that blue circle God came at just the right time for all the right reasons. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, Christmas Eve is a time when we approach that dividing line in human history, the doorway from BC to AC to AD, that revolution that happened when the Son of God made his entry into the world. Sometimes you know when you're on the eve of something big, your wedding, uh, moving to a new home, adopting a child, and sometimes you don't. Every Christmas Eve, we know we are about to mark the moment when Emmanuel came. So on the night before Christmas, find a quiet moment when you can think about what, what was about to happen in Bethlehem so many years ago. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Luke chapter 2 verse 20. In Christmas, everything lines up just the way it was meant to be. The shepherds heard, they saw, and it was all just as they had been told in a perfect conjunction of heaven and earth. God connected the two for his eternal purposes. Years later, Jesus would tell us in so many different ways, this is why I came. I have come as a light. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. The birth of Jesus was as intentional a divine act as anything we have seen in the history of the world. And so because of this we can pray, Thank you, Lord Christ, for humbling yourself and taking the form of man. Thank you for pushing back the darkness of this world and of my life. Thank you for fully living before us so that we can see just how much life we have. Let me live for the next 52 weeks in the light of your ongoing presence and power in this world. And then let me celebrate Christmas again with joy. Amen. Christmas is a time of joy. And while many, many, especially today, do not want Christ in Christmas. It doesn't matter because Christ is, his birth is what Christmas is all about. And as Christians, we celebrate the joy that Jesus Christ brought to us um, by entering the world and coming to us in the flesh, by offering us, he, he came and he brought us a free gift. And that's the gift of, gift of salvation. He paid for our sins. He conquered death. And so it doesn't, I mean, Satan wants to crush your joy. But Christmas is a time to meditate and reflect on what Jesus has done for us. And we should also be thinking about what can we do for others? Because Jesus told us to love your neighbor as you love yourselves. Minister to the needy, feed the sheep. 
Christmas doesn't have to be a time of presents, gifts. Um, it doesn't even have to include your family if you're far away and you're alone or you've lost people. Christmas is a time to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, this is a great time for you to learn about him and, uh, and accept him and the peace and joy that he offers you and the salvation that he freely gives you. Now's the time. I want to see you in heaven.